Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Venice Mace podcast. One of the most anticipated movies of the fall is Foxcatcher. It's the story of multimillionaire heir John DuPont and his murder of 1984 Olympic gold medalist Dave Schultz on January 26, 1996. The film features brilliant performances by Channing Tatum, Mark Ruffalo, and Steve Carell as DuPont. It's directed by Oscar nominee Bennett Miller and written by Academy Award nominee Dan Futterman and Emmy nominee E. Max Fry and Dan Futterman and Max Fry join me now. Gentlemen. Thank you for having us. So, you know, this is such a fascinating process because the script, my understanding is the story started with Max and then it was kind of handed off to Dan. How, how did that work? Maybe start with you, Max. Uh, I got a call from my agent in 2007, uh, and he said, hey, got this great project uh, for you. Uh, it's it's a, kind of a sports story, um, and it's with uh, Bennett Miller, who, whom I, I, I was familiar with from Capote, and uh, um, he said, you know, this is a fa- fabulous story. So I, I actually met Bennett, in, and uh, we sat down and talked about the what he wanted and what he was looking for and his vision of this really complex, interesting, tragic story. Uh, and we began to, he had collected a lot of, a lot of uh, material, photographs, interviews with wrestlers, public domain material, police reports. Um, so we sat down for a couple of months and began to hammer out what turned into really the story and how we were going to tell it. How did the story come to Bennett in the first place? Um, there was a gentleman by the name of Tom Heller who had uh, put together kind of a package, um, and I believe he, at the time, he had also optioned the life rights to Mark Schultz, uh, and he approached Bennett just kind of, uh, Ben, I, th- I believe, was at Tower Records signing Capote cassettes or <laughs> that, something. That's what you do with the indie movies. You're at Tower Records, you're signing your DVDs. <laughs> signing yeah. them, yes. Yeah, 10 bucks a piece. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he just, he stood in line and, and, and walked up to Bennett at one point and handed in this envelope and said, Mr. Miller, I think you'd be really interested in this material. And it took him a couple of weeks, but he said, uh, he, Bennett called him back and said, well, I love this. Now, Dan, you worked with, uh, with Bennett on Capote. Uh, in fact, you were an Oscar nominee, as I mentioned, for uh, for Capote. How, does this strike you? Does this surprise you? Is it in character with the kind of project that uh, that Bennett Miller likes? I think that he that Bennett is attracted to, and Capote Capote uh, had this. I think it's why when I gave him the script, he got he was uh, fascinated by it. It has in it characters who have fatal flaws. Um, Capote was. Uh, fatally ambitious, and um, and it and that ambition ruined his moral center, ruined his life, I, and, and and at least in my estimation, and, and and that was the kind of the movie that we made of it. In this, both both Dupont and Mark, coming from very different situations, are so desperate for respect and want the love and respect of the world and of Dave Schultz in particular. They end up battling each other over that love and respect of Dave uh, with, with terrible consequences. But, uh, but the, that sort of uh, setup of, with, not to get too intellectual about a sort of Greek tragedy of, of a character with a fatal flaw that can't but hurtle towards their, whatever this destiny is gonna be, a, a, a terrible one. Um, is something I know that that intrigues Bennett. I, so it doesn't surprise me that this caught his caught his eye and, and his heart. Max, kind of lay out the broad strokes of the story. I, I'll be honest. I knew nothing about the story. I knew there was a movie called Foxcatcher. I had no idea. I mean, maybe I've been under a rock. I had no idea anybody... Uh, was actually shot and killed in this movie. Lay, spoiler, lay, spoiler, spoiler alert! Spoiler <laughs> alert! Well, I think the <laughs> average tell you who. We're not gonna tell you the <laughs> average smart person may may know because they've read papers and stuff. Uh, describe sort of the broad strokes of the story. Uh, well, I mean, we we started off. We had this this foundation of a true story, which was this heir to the Dupont fortune, John Dupont. Uh, in his huge estate uh, with multi-hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, And he decided that he wanted to uh, put together uh, a wrestling team, USA Wrestlers, amateur wrestling, which was very underfunded and is probably still very underfunded. Almost got cut from the Olympics, right? 
What's that? It was cut from the Olympics, and they reinstated it. Right? Yeah. Is that right? Was it yeah. cut from the Olympics? Just, wow! Just recently, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's always been kind of the, the you know the redheaded stepchild of, of Olympic sport, even though it's one of the oldest sports out there. Um, and he put together a pretty fabulous uh, facility on his estate and, and built this great thing. And then he began to recruit uh, uh, Olympic caliber wrestlers. The one of the first being Mark Schultz. Um, and he began to build this uh, Olympic caliber wrestling team. Um, and, well, the story really is then what transpired on his, his uh, fox catcher farm over the next several years. And the tragic consequences of, of his own personality, Mark Schultz and Dave Schultz. Uh, who, we, who we start the story with having already won gold medals. Right. Uh, they both won gold medals in 1984 at the uh, Los Angeles Olympics. Um, so so describe Mark. He is obviously insecure. His success, it seems as though his brother uh, is sort of his his guide, his mentor, the guy that helps him to become an Olympic gold medalist. Describe kind of their relationship, Dan. Well, this was originally Dave Schultz's sport. Dave was doing it from a much younger age than, than Mark was. Mark was uh, Mark is an incredible athlete, a natural, uh, he was a gymnast, and was doing that at an extremely high level in high school in California. And Dave kind of brought him into the sport in in at like 16 right uh, i think he was a junior late, his first year insanely late age for for someone to become a world-class athlete at that you know at that sport and uh and he was great at it physically dave was the master dave was the guru of uh of uh feeling out his opponent psyching out his opponent he was not the natural athlete that Mark was. He was a weight class lower than Mark, but Mark could never beat him, literally never beat him in practice ever. And, uh, and so that relationship was, the power structure was clear. Dave was the leader, Mark was um, the uh, student, um, and he really looked up to Dave, and he just wanted his approval. Um, and they both won. They both won Olympic golds, training together, and they came out of that where Dave was a revered coach and Mark couldn't quite get a hold on life still, mm-hmm. even though he won an Olympic gold. Yeah, he's living in, you know, a, an apartment and he doesn't have really a social life. I he, mean, it's right. And he's given these he's given these talks at elementary schools. He's trying to cobbles together some wrestling clinics. It, Dave just had a way of attracting people that, you know, some people do, some people don't. And that's part of part of that. The the what goes on in this movie is you realize it's kind of a not winners and losers, but winners and all the rest. Right. Right. It, you know, so he moves, Mark moves from Dave being his mentor, his brother to falling under the, I guess, falling under the sway of, of <laughs> John, of, of John DuPont. Um, and it's, I mean, the whole thing is odd. John DuPont is obviously an incredibly wealthy guy. His, what, what drew him to, to wrestling in the first place? Wow. Um, you know, he claims that he wrestled when he was younger and, and loved the sport, uh, but that his, his mother uh, stopped him. Uh, from wrestling, it was a low sport because it was a, a low sport. A low sport, she sport says, and yes. she was, you know, an equestrian and raised horses and hounds and and that kind of thing. Very, very, um, you know, patrician. Um, and I, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but Dupont claimed that he had some affinity with wrestling and and always admired it. So at some point um, later in his life, decided that he was going to do become a benefactor coach mentor to wrestlers something that he couldn't have have done earlier in his life and dan it was kind of a uh the sport was underfunded yeah i think Uh, that's a lot of it it was it was an easy target um it was you know for someone with a lot of money in a weird way it was kind of low-hanging fruit if he wanted to be involved in sports this was a good way for him to get in that's right um and you get to wear a singlet so (laughs) yeah of course which which by the way i mean I don't know what's going on with John DuPont. I mean, he's when when you were writing his character, 
What what's going on inside his head? What are what are those dynamics? He's he comes from wealth. He's been very insulated. I mean, what what who is he? I think that we you know it was important to both Max and to me and to Bennett as well to not to not make final judgments about about him to be clear about what the circumstances were. He was a, a deeply lonely guy, and he was somebody who had not been. Um, by all reports, he had not been nurtured very much as a child by his, his dad had left early. His, his mom was not the warmest mother. And he has played of, here by Vanessa Redgrave in the film. Incredibly. incredibly. She's not, she's not bad. She's, yeah. she, I don't know where he found her, but she makes a splash. Oh yeah, she does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think she's got a good future at ever. Um, so, so he and he and he relates the story, which was a true story, to, in the film to Mark that his mom had paid the chauffeur, the chauffeur's son, to be his friend as a child. He really mm. didn't have any friends, and so he was casting around. He tried to be an Olympic pentathlete. This is true. Um, John Dupont. John Dupont yes. had. He didn't quite make it. He strikes me as not very athletic. Uh, I don't think he was a great athlete. I don't think he was a terrible <laughs> athlete. He was a decent swimmer. I think. <laughs> Right? He was not an Olympic caliber. <laughs> right, exactly. None of us are. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, he was fine, I guess. But uh, but he, actually, that's sort of instructive, right? Because he's, he's got this grandiose sense of himself, right? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And whatever he can't naturally acquire, and that's basically everything he buys. And so he buys the wrestling team, and he buys the title of head coach whatever that means right and you know you had you had much more contact with john juro was the wrestling consultant um who had been at fox catcher he was a you know world-class wrestler and he ended up he was the uh he was the wrestling choreographer but uh, max had, had much more contact with him he can talk about that yeah the that sort of the the wrestling choreographer and the you know that sort of thing but because by the way we should say i was just that's the part of it that blew me away was the the way that I know nothing about wrestling, but the way that uh, these actors, Channing Tatum, Mark Ruffalo, were able to physically pull this off. I mean, they are completely convincing as wrestlers. Uh, yes. And, and John Jura uh, worked with those guys a lot. Um, I, I believe Mark uh, Ruffalo had had wrestled in high school himself. He, he was like a state, state, New York State wrestler. He was a great wrestler in high yeah. school. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so he had an advantage there. But, but um, you know, um, they really trained and really worked hard. And I think it's a tribute to both those guys. If you look at their speed and the skill with which they execute the moves, it's pretty phenomenal. And there were no doubles. I you know right. I, I asked I asked Jura um, recently because somebody had asked me if there was any uh, there were any stunt doubles or wrestling doubles and he said nope that was all those guys and including by the way um, that is uh, Channing Tatum doing the backflip that you, is well you see well, you watch that well, you watch Mark Schultz win the worlds right worlds That's what, yeah win the worlds and he stands up. And he does this backflip, and and Channing Tatum did Channing it. Channing did it. He yep. did it on set. He's he's. I mean, he's clearly he's a great athlete. Whatever. Yeah. I don't know if he ever put it. I think he did play football in, in uh, yeah high school, maybe a little college. But yeah. um, but he's a terrific athlete. And you yeah. can see it. You yeah. see it on film. There's. I mean, there's a sequence there near the beginning of the maybe at the beginning of the film where there's there's no way there could be a double. I mean, there's sort of. Uh, forehead yeah. to forehead yeah. and there's there's no possible way and they are so convincing you would think that they are olympic wrestlers yeah well i i in, in, invite you and all your listeners to go on youtube and look at the real mark schultz and dave schultz and then compare the actors to those guys and it is just astounding at how much they embody those those two guys and and their moves and the way they hold themselves the way they walk it, it's really fantastic. I think Ruffalo had to learn how to how to wrestle lefty, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Something that a, a detail that not many will pick up, right? Yeah, well, but yeah, but not not easy. Not easy at all, yeah. right? Uh, so I want to kind of go back to process here a little bit. Um, what I've read is that Bennett and I guess uh, you guys are big fans of this sort of use a three by five card and 
pin it to the wall and try to create a, a structure for the film. Describe sort of that process, Dan. Uh, well, anytime, I mean, I do this, I write with my wife as well, Anya Epstein, we write uh, television together. We do the same thing. You know, you, got, you have to get your story straight before you can start writing a script. At least that's how I work. I, I know there are writers who who just start and and I sort of in a way wish I could be one of them but you do that you do that <laughs> you, you do that you, you just start writing free form I'm just on going <laughs> yeah I mean I go from character and then but anyway I know the card trick too okay. yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so any you know that's how that's how I do it naturally and it's how Bennett I, you know who's an extremely visual person obviously as a as a director and and so you get it you just get it all up on the wall you guys did that first get it all up on the wall what's the story what's a sequence of scenes um and then anytime uh when max had to move on to other projects and, and i came in we put the scenes back up on the wall and i did a number of drafts over a number of years and every time where we re-examined it um and did the, the start you start from scratch and are these scenes working is the sequence working can we extract anything because there's always kind of a long script um and uh and then on the other side where all the kind of reject scenes or possible scenes or new scenes we thought of or a weird story we'd heard or uh would that fit anywhere right um and that was a multi-year process yeah and this pro this uh entire project took max i guess eight years in total right which is not that unusual in hollywood um in between the time bennett signed on <clears throat> and i signed on uh there was a writer's strike uh, there was a little economic turmoil. Uh, that, oh, I heard about that. Yeah, that, that <laughs> was it. That 2008 thing yeah, that I've read about. Yeah. Thing, uh, I believe stripped the financing from the from the movie, um, and the movie kind of went into limbo at that point. And, and Bennett decided that he was going to go do Moneyball, uh, and then you know, Dan came back around after that when Bennett had completed that, and they began to work on it again. And so that that was part of the process. But but you know. It, it was, you know, honestly, I think it was a blessing because it, it, it is, it is I, I think, an extremely valuable thing. You don't get this in television very much because you're working very quickly. But to be able to put something away, he, did, he went off and did Moneyball. I went off and uh, uh, Anya and I did the show In Treatment on mm -hmm. HBO. And we came back after that. And you really do get a little perspective on what you've done, the stuff that you think, oh, that's great, that's working, it's perfect. I think that's actually not so perfect. Let's, we need to reexamine this and make sure we're all, we're, all of this is working. And I think the, the time it took was a blessing, it was also a blessing that um, Channing Tatum went from this right. really interesting right because Channing Tatum was actor. sort of a part of the project all the way back to when he did well, well, when I was working with Bennett he came in one day and he goes hey I met this uh, <clears throat> this actor uh, he's really he's been done some MMA stuff and he's really he's re the real deal uh, yeah I, I think he's really great I said uh, what well, you know what's his name and he's Channing Tatum and I said never heard of him and that was 2007 wow so, uh, sometimes you get lucky um <laughs> all of the things that happened in the interim and here's Channing Tatum and here's the, the, the feel of the zeitgeist is went in our, our favor also. And yes, you can't plan for that. You know, seven years ago, eight years ago, we weren't planning for Channing Tatum to be a big movie star, but well, and Channing at that point when he originally spoke with Bennett sounds like, I mean, from what I've read, wasn't even sure if he was ready for a role like that. Right. That may be true. I mean, I, you know, honestly, I, I remember watching him. Uh, I know the movie that Bennett saw that yeah. made him go meet with him. The, uh, guy, the guy, the guy to recognizing your saints. Yeah. He's phenomenal in that movie. And I, I remember the experience of watching that movie. I was supposed to watch it for another actor. And I came out of watching that thinking, who the hell is that guy? It felt like the second coming of Marlon Brando to me. It, he just seemed this like you know easy access to his emotional life it was, like, it was it was uh he was incredible and so i could see the seeds of this performance and that performance but maybe he didn't feel ready for it who knows uh he's certainly ready for it now because he's incredible in the movie uh the other uh, amazing piece of casting is steve carell who actually just i was telling you guys i saw him on 60 minutes last night talking about the film um he is uh you know, if you were to have described the character to me, the John DuPont character, I, I could have made a list of, you know, many, many actors and Steve Carell would not have been on it. How how did Steve Carell come to be John DuPont in Foxcatcher? Uh, you know, I'm going to 
defer. defer. You're going to punt on that one? That to, yeah. to Dan. But I'll tell you, when, when I was talking to Ben, and there were many lists made with many names on it, and Steve Carell was not on any of those lists. So uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll let Dan, because he's closer to that than I am. There, there, there was a long time where it was unclear, you know, A, how the movie was going to get made and with whom, um, because there's just a reality of uh, this business that you need to finance on the backs of particularly a movie like this, of uh, actors who people are interested in. And luckily, Channing Tatum became one of those actors. There was a list of actors that Bennett was thinking about, but I think I think everyone felt a little bit um, on the nose. Like, mm-hmm. you would think that what ends up happening in the movie would come out of this person. And Steve Carell, at a certain point, got suggested... I don't know exactly what the genesis of it was, but I think for Bennett it just felt right. Like it, you could you could see from some of his, I mean, he's a, clearly a brilliant guy in many different ways. But from um, Little Miss Sunshine, right? You could see he he had he had the dramatic ability. Even you know it's weird the, when I saw this movie, Hope Springs. Yeah, he played the psychiatrist, uh, psychiatrist yeah. and I thought, all right, there's some there's more than. Than that guy there, you Absolutely. know. Absolutely, and, and and you know, and, he, and I think it just it intrigued him that what, that would be non traditional casting. That would be a surprise. The darkness would be a surprise, and they met. And I think Bennett felt like he, he has it. He's ready to dive in and express that. And, uh, and you know, and you get it's 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 just it's it's like magic. You know, you see him on screen. He's sort of unrecognizable physically. He first. he is. I mean, you would have to. The average person would have to look twice before they knew yes. well, that Steve Carell. John John Jura was on set because he was doing all the wrestling uh, consulting and, and and technical stuff. And he he said the first time that uh, Carell walked in in full makeup with wardrobe, that he jumped out of his skin. He turned around and there was John Dupont. It flipped him out. Yeah, I mean, if you go back and look at pictures of John Dupont, it's a little. It's a little eerie. I mean, he really, he really got it both physically and the, the, the makeup is extraordinary. It, it absolutely is, yeah. And uh, and he brought also to what could be simply a dark movie uh, these moments of of levity and 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 sort of strangeness that um, that give the movie a whole other level. to, yeah. to you know, take pleasure from. Is um, John Dupont. I was trying to th- now he's been since described as schizophrenic when when you're writing a character like that I mean what what's going on inside John DuPont's head are you writing mental illness or are you writing just yep. you know Ben and I talked a lot about you know how we wanted to portray DuPont and and the two things that we that we said were you know we don't want to portray him as crazy and we don't want to portray him as a monster um, and so, <clears throat> you know, I, 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 there was clearly some kind of, by the end, some kind of thought perception disorder manifesting itself, um, you know, but he's John DuPont and he's worth a lot of money <clears throat> and who's going to say to John DuPont, you can't do that. So you and I might be stopped before we got to the place where John DuPont got to, but, uh, but nobody said no to him, and that again is part of the story and part of the part of the interest. And there was never <clears throat> um, any clearly defined diagnosis of John Dupont before the murder. So we don't know for sure what his mental state was. We, there's only anecdotal evidence of of mental illness. And and we should point out John Dupont uh, died in prison. Yeah, uh, in 2010, ago. I believe, right? 2010. Something like that. I think well, it's yeah, some, something like that. Yeah, um, is um, describe the relationship between Mark again. This is the Channing Tatum character and Dupont. What what is going on there? It's it's there's something suggested, but I, I can't quite tell if there's something homoerotic going on. Obviously, there's drug use. What what's going on between those two? I think there was a lot of loneliness going on, and there was a. Um, they, they were getting from each other. Uh, Dupont was getting some reverence from Mark that he was desperate for. Um, Mark was um, being groomed as a great 
great athlete by DuPont and respected for that, um, being paid well for the first time in his life. Uh, he was the coach of the wrestling team, you know, under head coach John DuPont, but he was assembling this wrestling team. And so for a while, it was mutually beneficial. Um, the In terms of what you're talking about, um, I don't know, maybe, we, you know, Max had a conversation with John Jura about, about this, and that you could probably answer that question better. I think in terms of labeling, we didn't want to do that. Clearly right. there was a... But there's something. The, absolutely. Is it is it a desire for closeness? Is it a desire for uh, an expression of something else that can only be expressed through we're going to you know, put on the wrestling gear and get on the mat, and so it's condoned in some way. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but you, you had a conversation with John about that, right? I, you know, I, 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 one point when I'm writing, I, I, I asked John, you know, um, if if Dupont walked into, you know, the the wrestling room and he said to you, "I want to wrestle," did you wrestle him? And he said, "Yeah, we all did." And I said, did, "Was there anything that you felt ever felt that?" There was some ulterior motive to what he was doing with the wrestling, and and he said, "No, I I never felt that." Um, but I I think what Dan just said is is an important thing. Sports, athletics, wrestling allows men to be in close contact with each other without without anybody questioning their manhood. I also think that Dupont was born and grew up in a very sterile environment, and this allowed him to touch another human being. And I think that maybe was really important to him. Yeah, because he obviously didn't have a hug your mother sort of, <laughs> you know, she, she was a tough, yeah. tough old broad. Right? Yeah, and she loved horse flesh. Yeah, yeah she, she, she did. Son. Yes, yeah. she did. Um, so when you, I, I wanted to just say, you know, Steve Carell, amazing, right? Channing Tatum, you know, the, I think the best thing he's done. Ruffalo is the guy that's that's potentially going to be lost, sort of, in the conversation about uh, awards and whatnot. For for me, he's he's really the heart of the movie, and there's um there's a stillness about him, and he does a lot of listening. Which I think is, you know, hard. He does a lot of just being on screen. Dan, you're all. I mean, you're also an actor. Describe what you know. What What do you think of Ruffalo, and what did he bring to the to that role of Dave? Well, I, I've I have loved him since I saw him in uh, in theater, you know, over a decade ago in New York, and he. I, I think he is a very very special actor, incredibly sensitive, incredibly versatile, and he's obviously a great athlete too. Um, he that was you know that role was the biggest piece of the puzzle that max and bennett started working out how he figured into this dynamic uh he to me is a guy who um could be all the things you're saying uh fatherly or older brotherly um encouraging a great listener um but it was always on his own terms and you couldn't buy him and you couldn't force him to do anything he didn't want to do. And the fact that Mark had never beat him was really important. Um, and the fact that DuPont could never buy him was really important. And so as long as you're on his terms, he's great. But when you're not, you're going to end up on your back on the mat. And I think that Mark has that both, has that power as an actor and, uh, and just as a person. Um, he is a gentle, lovely guy but he knows who he is and uh and he knows what he wants and and you see that you see that through this character um in a in a really really strong and seamless way and it's so important for the movie you know you guys are about to go on the uh that sort of crazy ride that happens that you were on with with capote um because you know this movie is going to get a lot of Academy Award contention, uh, attention. Um, it is going to be on best 10 lists. Uh, it is going to be on, uh, you know, critics lists all over the place. What, you know, you've been through it. What is that? What's that like? And I, I know you're being 
I'm being the presumptuous one here. You're not being the presumptuous one. But what is that experience like of going that you know red carpets and awards and all that sort of thing? Look, if that if you know if that happens with this movie, that'd be thrilling. And and it it's it's just a you know it was a long time, as you said, in in coming to fruition. And if if people respond to it in that way, that's you know that's fantastic. It's something you can't control, but you know it would be it would be wonderful for everybody. Um, everybody's work on this movie is is uh, is incredible. Um, for Capote, it was sort of bizarre. You know, it was it was thrilling because it was shocking. I mean, it was shocking that the movie ever got made. It was shocking that that Phil Hoffman was allowed to you know put a movie like that on his back and carry it across the finish line because he really hadn't done that before. Although everybody saw him as this great actor who'd be great in that supporting role. You know, um, it was shocking that Bennett as a first time narrative filmmaker he'd done a great documentary um was given the opportunity to do that movie and then that it turned out good <laughs> you know it was just the whole thing was like a fairy tale and so it became pretty clear at a certain point like maybe we'll get some attention maybe phil will win like mm-hmm. wouldn't that be crazy but none of us the rest of us are going to win anything we're just kind of along for the ride and let's just have fun and have some free drinks like that that was and cheer phil that was right. basically what it felt like and it was uh that was just fun it yeah was great yeah um, what do you want audiences to sort of take away from this film? I have to tell you, Max, when I walked out of the theater, I was disturbed. <laughs> and I mean that in a good way, right? We want movies to, to move us and to make us feel something. There's a, there's a, there's a kind of creepiness about this story that sticks with, I mean, I, I, I Thought, I seen it, saw it a couple of months ago, but I thought about it pretty regularly, and I always describe how a movie sits in my head. You know, do I refer back to it? Am I still thinking about it days afterwards? This is one of those movies. What yeah. do you? What do? What do audiences take away from this? I, I think just what you did. Um, I think everybody is is there. I think one of our objectives was to not deliver a here's what you're supposed to think about this because. You can't. We, John Dupont never stated why he shot Dave. Nobody knows why. Um, and so I think one of the things that makes the movie work is is that you're watching this thing unfold and you're looking at it and you're left to feel and interpret what you've seen however you like. Um, I, one of the best compliments that I've heard so far is that um, a, a film critic I talked to said um, that this movie would hold up to uh, anything that he saw in the 1970s, which were kind of the second age, golden age of Hollywood, which I thought was a great compliment. Yeah. Because I, there's so many movies in, during that You know, period. that's absolutely true. You know, that's my favorite era of film, too, 68 to 74. Um, you know, those films are... Those films are the ones that I was... They happened a little bit before my time, but, you know, I was a, uh, I'm proud to say, a pop culture major at Bowling Green State University. <laughs> and so I actually wrote papers on those films. Yeah. Um, that era, and you're right, it does have that feeling of that era, that sort of open-ended conclusion that's left for, for interpretation, I think, um, that, that I think makes it sort of stick with me. Uh, it, it sits really well in my head, which, you know, most movies are in and out and gone. <laughs> this one, this one, I think, sticks with me in a in a really, really powerful way. Um, are you? Um, how has the family reacted to this film? How is like Nancy Schultz, who's uh, Dave's widow? Mm-hmm. Um, I the 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 world of wrestling um, and and guys that were also part of. Uh, fox catcher how, how how do they feel about the film i haven't spoken personally with nancy i met her years ago when i when i started i went to a wrestling tournament in colorado springs uh just to kind of get a sense of the world and she was there with her son alexander and her and dave's son um and she was very welcoming and and kind uh about the movie and open and available um i think she visited set and I think she's doing a, from what I understand, she's doing a little bit of a tour with the movie to 
college wrestling programs yeah. just mm-hmm. to kind of get it in the community. And so I think she's on board and feels um, like it like it does Dave um, proud. I, I, I yeah. think that that's right. I hope that that's right. Yeah, I think so too. And I, I also think that she she's always been a big uh, um, promoter, champion, um, friend of amateur wrestling um, ever since uh, Dave Dave died. And um, I think this is part of that too. Is is um, kind of presenting this to the wrestling community that she's supported all these years. Um, yeah. Uh, well, the movie is Foxcatcher. It opens uh, this Friday uh, on a limited basis. I believe it's New York and L.A. and some select cities, and then it will wind up uh, opening everywhere, of course. Um, expect to hear, I'll, I'll say, expect to hear all kinds of awards uh, prognostication uh, for this film because it is it is that kind of movie, and, and everybody deserves accolades from Steve Carell, who gives kind of the, you know, the big performance in the film Channing Tatum's amazing Mark Ruffalo's amazing it's uh, Bennett Miller uh, you guys the script uh, it's it's just it's a it's a great piece of work so uh, thank you I I strongly recommend that everybody see Foxcatcher as soon as possible uh, Emacs Fry uh, we can just call you Max right yep that's it uh, and uh, Dan Futterman congratulations and thanks a lot for coming in thank you for having us and yeah. thanks a lot for listening to the Venice Mace podcast <laughs>